Okay, welcome back everybody. It's been a little while since I've done one of these um, Armory Chats. This is going to be, uh, I guess, Armory Chat episode 31, and I'm going to title this the DPRK Missile Truce. Um, I've been threatening to do one of these for a while, kind of like the certain leader of North Korea. Um, and I, I've compiled a bunch of questions that I, I get mostly in email or private message on Facebook. And, and some of you who are regulars that want to talk to me about this kind of stuff, some of this will be repetitive for you. So obviously it's not going to be in your interest to watch this, but I want to go ahead and get this, get this on tape or recorded or video. So we have it because it, eventually this is going to become, this is going to, you know, become an, so a topic of discussion as, as things kind of heat up. So a lot of the stuff that's reported in the media is flat out wrong, or a lot of the stuff that's reported in the media is really old news. It's like, for example, there's been all this hyperbolic talk about all of a sudden North Korea has miniaturized nuclear weapons. It's like, well, I got news for you. Their entire missile program, nuclear weapons program, has always been a miniaturized program. Nobody builds Nobody builds the fat man and little boy that we did in World War II. I mean, that's 1940s technology. Even, I mean, without getting into too much detail, I mean, there are countries in Europe today that are not considered nuclear powers that actually had invested time and money into into developing nuclear weapons until they abandoned until they abandoned those projects, say in the 60s or the 70s. And those countries always went right for the compact nuclear weapons because they're deliverable. Nobody delivers nuclear weapons pushing a big giant, you know, giant, you know, fat man on the back of a C-130. I mean, that's just, that's not how nuclear weapons are delivered today. So, you know, the, and, and, you know, the media has been talking about how, they've been talking about how all of a sudden uh, the DPRK can hit can hit cities in the U.S. Well, surprise, uh, there were some of the testing that, that they had done some months ago, even though they were lofting the missiles, looking at, you know, the modeling and the speed, the acceleration, and, and some of the other stuff. It was obvious months, many, many months ago that that these missiles, uh, they could at least hit New York, but nobody nobody would admit that. Everybody was kind of whistling past the graveyard on this. At least the media was, the defense industry analysts and the uh, you know nuclear pro proliferation crowd. It was very obvious late last year that they were going to be able to do this. And actually, there's a couple more surprises concerning the DPRK that the mainstream media has not given you yet, but we'll work our way through it. So, all right. I guess the first big one, here's here's a question. Can the DPRK hit the US? Yes. Can we shoot their missiles down? Yes and no. Here's, I'm gonna give you a list of our anti-missile systems, and then I'm gonna then I'm going to tell you what what the media doesn't tell you. Okay. Everyone knows about the PAC-3, which is the Patriot anti-missile system. It became real famous. I mean there's an upgraded version of PAC-3, but the the you know everyone learned about the Patriot missile systems during the first Gulf War shooting down Scuds. There's the Thad system, uh, which is uh, it used to be terminal high altitude. Now it's or is there no it was theater theater high now it's terminal high altitude. They changed the name on it, but Thad is a is a theater anti ballistic missile system. There's the Navy's SM2s and the SM3s, and you'll occasionally see news reports of the Navy testing these SM2s and the SM3s hitting stuff, um, you know, in orbit or hitting not it's not in orbit, but in say mid phase, which I'll have to explain in a minute. Then there's something called the GBI, which is the ground-based interceptors, and at least publicly, those interceptors are based in there in uh, Alaska. And then there's, I think there's some in Vandenberg. Is it Vandenberg in, in California? So the ground-based interceptors. So, okay, here, here's the first lie that the media intimates to the public that, that the average citizen would be shocked by. None of these systems talk to each other. Okay, so if you're sitting at home and you're watching the news and you're listening to the, 
the PAC system, the THAAD system, the Navy missiles, and then the Air Force's ground-based interceptors, you have this image that they lead you to believe that it's like screen level one, and then there's screen level two, and screen level three, and four, and five. And the truth is, a lot, of, most of these systems, actually all of these systems, operate independently. And um, not only do they operate independently, they, you know, they function very differently. Like, for example, some of the lofting uh, tests that you saw, like um, a few weeks ago, there was a. Uh, uh, the North Koreans launched a ballistic missile and everyone talks about how high it went above the uh, International Space Station. There is some debate uh, whether if that had been, let's say let's, that's, that had been an attack. So this is South Korea and this is North Korea. Instead of firing a missile like this, they loft it way up into the air. There is some debate as to whether the THAAD system actually would have even seen the seen the missile coming down because it's a, it's a loft. It's it's not looking over the horizon. It's 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 the angle of attack is so great that the system may not have even seen it. So to give to give you just to give you an idea, at least the limitations of THAAD and and, and some of the other systems. Um, Another thing, another common misconception that the media lets people believe, they don't say this directly, but they, they let people believe it. They talk about how the Navy has these Aegis missile destroyers with the SM-2 and the SM-3, and we're going to shoot these missiles down. Well, there's a couple problems with that. The, the truth is the Navy is... It's very unlikely that the Navy's going to be able to shoot these missiles down, um, at least in the way that that a lot of the American pundits talk about it. So one of the common things you'll see is when they do a test, we're going to have our Navy ships, when they launch a test missile, we're going to blow it out of the sky. Well, that's kind of horseshit. So let me explain. Uh, let me uh, give you the basic outline how missile works and then kind of how the how the world is shaped and we'll figure this out oversimplified a a nuclear missile ha basically has three three phases of how of how it flies okay so there's the boost phase so boost it up into orbit mid course and then terminal phase okay so sh up in the air it starts crossing over and then it comes in, you know, for the final approach. And there's, there's, there's a couple things you can add to that, especially when you get to advanced, you know, nuclear missiles and, and, and some of the countermeasures. And I don't want to want to, I don't want to get too deep into that because the truth is DPRK doesn't really have all that, doesn't have that ability yet. To, so we don't need to, to get into it. The first thing you need to remember is when you're going after a nuclear missile, you don't want to get it on the terminal phase when it's coming in for the final strike because because the reality is everything is hard and when things are moving super fast it makes everything harder so when you know the boost phase the mid-course phase and then either it's a single warhead reentry vehicle or a bunch of them coming in they're coming in so fast that it's much more difficult it's much more difficult to get a kin kinetic kill to, to contact that thing. So, I mean, you can kind of just forget this part here, the whole the whole terminal phase. So let's talk boost phase, you know, and you see it in the media all the time. You see it on the internet. You see this pundits and these jackasses saying they don't even know what the hell they're talking about. So Korea, let's say they, they launch a missile and it's in the boost phase, okay? A Navy ship to get that missile in the quote boost phase typically would have to be relatively close to the Korean coast to be able to even possibly make you know have a chance to hit the thing and you generally speaking in in any missile warfare technology you don't want to be chasing stuff from behind so the missiles and you're trying to get it from behind that sucks and also um, you know when uh, uh, the, the Navy ships, if they're going to come in closer to the Korean Peninsula, they're more likely to get whacked by submarines or anti-ship missile or, or, or whatever. So now let's let's look at the world for a minute. This is the real critical one. When they talk about the SM2, SM3, and the Navy's going to the Navy's going. Let me get something circular. The Navy's going to 
um, shoot these missiles down. Okay, on a map, if you're looking at this, I guess I'll do it in reverse. If, if, this, if this is Korea, and then this is the United States, and this is a Pacific Ocean, okay? And everybody's thinking about these missiles flying over the Pacific Ocean, and the Navy's going to get shots at them. Well, the truth is, you know, the world is round, surprise, surprise, and if I'm North Korea and I want to fire a missile at New York City, going over the Pacific Ocean is the long way around to the barn door, just like with Russia and just like with, you know, on some level China, most of these missiles are going to fly over the North Pole. They're not going to fly over the Pacific Ocean anyway. Now, maybe if they take a shot at Guam or they want to take a shot at Hawaii, that's a different argument. But, you know, the, the North Korea fires a missile at the United States. Pretty, It's going to fly over Russia. It's not going to fly over the U.S. Navy. The Navy's not going to get a, sh not going to get a shot at it. If, uh, if North Korea fires a missile at New York City. There is probably not a ship in the U.S. Navy that's not even going to get a shot at that missile. So you can pretty much just forget all that out. So now let's go into the ground-based interceptors, the GBI system, okay, um, which has been tested, and there's been some successful kinetic kills, and, you know, it, it, the system does work. However, you have to look at it mathematically as far as the success rates. So, okay, Korea has roughly six, they, 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 official estimates are that North Korea has roughly 60, maybe 60 nuclear weapons. That's nuclear, maybe nuclear devices. That's not missiles. That's not where we're at right now. So the, the, the official, again, this is all classified and nobody really knows the answer to this. I'm not saying I know the answer to this because I, I obviously do not, but this is what the official public policy a public position is on the ground-based interceptors. If uh, and if a North Korean missile is coming over Russia, and uh, you know Alaska or Vandenberg are going to fire a missile at it, the plan we have roughly they say, well, what's the chance of, of our anti anti missile missile hitting this thing? They're well, it's about fifty percent, fifty fifty. Well, how do you mathematically get to a hundred percent? You, um, you, you their their plan is to fire roughly maybe five ground based interceptors, you know, at these missiles. So, because they don't want to do just one, that there's a mechanical malfunction, some unknown anomaly, you fire your one missile, your one anti ballistic missile at at the thing, and just for some reason it doesn't work. So the the goal is to shoot say four or five of them. So it's you know we're going to salvo a bunch of them up there and. Chances are, if one missile comes over, or maybe two missiles come over, that we have a reasonably good chance of of probably taking that missile out. Um, you would think. I mean, it's nothing's ever nothing's ever for certain. And the truth is, there's people in the West Wing and the White House and the Pentagon, and you know, that work in you know continuity government and you know the military de you know defense command and control establishment that they know that it, nothing's 100 percent certain you could you could lose a city you know you could have you know you could you could have an impact so so there's there's that issue now let's talk about how let's talk about the threat the real threat that you have that nobody really wants to talk. I was talking to a Canadian guy about this while so I was overseas. Um, he kind of was asking questions about Trump and asking about this. And I kind of explained some stuff to him. It's like, okay, we're going to fire anti-ballistic missiles. The battle is going to take place over, you know, over Canada, the North Pole, and, and, and all of that. So think about this terrible scenario for a second. Here's, here's North Korea, here's Russia. North Korea fires a missile. There's been North Korean missile tests that the Russians haven't even detected. Like the international community's been like, there's been a missile test, there's been this, there's been that, and the Russians are like, what are you talking about? We didn't see shit. And they're like, oh, yeah, okay, we saw it. No, you didn't. They, didn't. they didn't goddamn see it. So North Korea could potentially fire a missile at the United States. It starts going over Russia and the North Pole. Russia doesn't see it. 
we detect the launch. Maybe we don't detect the launch initially. Maybe we detect it, you know, mid-course up in the atmosphere. So we fire a bunch, we salvo five missiles at this incoming North Korean missile. The Russians have their entire defense establishment kind of set up to look at the U.S. They, have, they don't even see the North Korean missile launch. But all of a sudden, they see five missiles coming up from American bases. That has the potential to be a little bit of a, of a, of a bad situation. You know, could the Russians overreact? Now, let's think about this. Let's say everything goes perfect. North Korean missile comes up. We launch a salvo of five missiles. It first missile makes a hit. It, it you know it all works great. Now there's four there's four anti ballistic missiles coming up behind it. Where do they go? Do we blow them up in the atmosphere? Do we have the ability to self destruct these in the atmosphere? There's a lot of debate as to whether that's even a safe thing to do. And you know you don't nuclear like internet ICBMs and, and a lot of these missile systems. You can't have an adversary hack your your self-destruct mechanism if you don't have a self-destruct mechanism, or some kind of you know way like if it, if it flies for a certain amount of time and, and you know maybe it self-destructs. So, do these missiles do they blow up in the air or do they land in Russia? And how does Russia handle that? How was Russia's first indication that there's even anything going on when shit starts falling in Siberia? You know, I mean it or. Uh, 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 you know, think about a broken up uh, North Korean radiological mess coming down either in Siberia, Alaska, or Canada, or or the northern mid mid United States. I mean, it's kind of a kind of a big clusterfuck. And so, one of the issues also, we're talking about one missile or two missiles. So. North Korea has let's let's just say they have 60 missiles just for argument's sake and you know let's say we can get them all you know let's say we can, let's say we can get most of them so you know we get 58 of the let's say they have 60 missiles we knock out 58 of them in some kind of preemptive decapitation whatever strike two of them come up you know we're able to t take them out what happens in 5 years when North Korea has 100 missiles are we going to fire I mean, is it going to be five of our anti-ballistic missiles for every one of theirs? My point is, you can see very quickly, and everybody knows this, everybody in the Pentagon knows this, everybody in the defense establishment knows this, that this game is, you're going to lose this game. The missile defense system works against one or two missiles or, you know, maybe a handful of missiles, but it becomes very, very expensive and almost functionally impossible to be on this, you know, we're going to have so much defense to beat all, you can, you can overwhelm the system. And it's not going to be that hard to build enough missiles to overwhelm any anti-ballistic missile system. That's why, you know, we never really had um, a fully flushed out, innovative ballistic missile system against, against the Russians. Because the technology isn't really quite there to be able to, to, to take this stuff out. I mean, you, you, the system isn't set up to be able to handle a real attack. It, it's really set up to handle rogue states. So that's that. So next question, and I get this one, variations of this question all the time, and this is a, the fault of the U.S. media. Are DPRK's missiles for real, or are they any good? <sighs> yes. First of all, their missiles are real. One of the problems we have in the U.S. is that our media and our defense establishment and a lot of our, our policy wonks, and I've even done it myself, you know, we infantilize North Korea. We, we disrespect North Korea, you know, little Kim, little fat boy, little this, little that, whatever, you know. And the truth is North Korea is probably the world's preeminent rogue missile country they have they have perfected um engine technology that was complicated from the russians they had acquired engine technology from uh or, or missile technology from the egyptians years ago i mean there used to be even a dprk missile test facility in egypt most people don't know that it was a long time ago dprk 
North Korea, I mean, they, they, uh, they're, they're working on solid fuel. They've got liquid fueled down pretty well. They worked on light and airframes. They've got reentry vehicles. Uh, they've, they've developed a compact nuclear, uh, nuclear, a compact, you know, nuclear weapon. So it's, it's launchable. They've got a space program. They've got, uh, uh, they've, they the, the, uh, the North Koreans actually have a, nuclear submarine missile program they are planning on launching being able to put a nuclear weapon on a submarine and take it out to sea now maybe their submarine may not be able to you know float for more than five minutes but they're pretty confident you know the people that study this stuff that the dprk is uh, they're going to end up with having a nuclear capable submarine It'll probably have one missile in it um the ones that i've seen um, they've done some testing with some barges, and as a matter of fact, you'd even see some video maybe last year of the leader of, of North Korea, you know, they were doing a missile test, you saw a missile fly out of the water, and maybe, you know, there was it was doctored, or it was this, or it was that. The truth is, we're not talking about a bunch of guys in Alamogordo, Mexico, New Mexico, who are, you know, cobbling together some little hillbilly bomb that they're going to push out of the back of some airplane. This is a pretty advanced missile program, and the North Koreans are getting pretty good at it, okay? Their, their Scud missile technology is, is, is cutting edge. Their, their ICBM technology is cutting edge. There was, a, there was a, a missile test. It was, I think it was early this year or last year, and it's called, um, a cold, it was a cold launch test. Um, uh, it was, uh, um, uh, it was, uh, done on land and it was, uh, it's a, it's a system you use it for submarines, but they tested it on land. So everybody, everybody obsessed on it in terms of, you know, of it being like this transport erector launcher, like a missile truck, this thing it's, you know, uses compressed air and it shoots the missile out of the, out of the tube. And then it, it goes up into the air and it long and it, and then it ignites and it, it starts, it starts flying. That is a technology that you use in nuclear ballistic missile submarines. Just look at any Trident Polaris missile launch, uh, on YouTube and you will see very quickly that it's a jet of compressed air shoots a thing out of the tube, it breaks the surface and then the thing, then the thing ignites. Now, what didn't get a lot of play in U.S. media that I'll go ahead and, 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 and reference here was this particular test that I'm talking about where they shot the missile up out of the, out of the truck launcher into the air and it ignited. This missile did not go the traditional, say, I don't know, let's say two or three missile lengths up into the air. This missile that they shot out of this tube in this tr on this truck shot way, 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 way up in the air. It was kind of unusual. Now, why would they do that? I mean, I mean, again, everything has to have a trade-off. Why would you spend the effort or the, or, or the money or the engineering to throw a missile that high into the air if you don't need to do it? Well, the answer is, the North Koreans are working on probably a heavier warhead with a heavier payload, probably a thermonuclear weapon, so an H-bomb, not an A-bomb. Everything they've got right now are A-bombs. There is uh, there's some speculation that the uh, DPRK is working on a much heavier H-bomb that they're going to stick on, on the, one of these missiles, which is why that missile shot up so high in the air to begin with. Again, we can't, we got to stop infantilizing North Korea and thinking that they're a bunch of bobos and they can't do this. The, tr the truth is they're doing it. North Korea has a very viable missile program and it is no joke. Okay, so that's out of the way. Um, why did Obama let them build a compact nuke? That one came in recently. Obama didn't let them build a compact nuke, as I said before. Nobody builds Nobody builds uh, the fat man, little boy. Everybody goes for the compact nuke. It's always going to be a compact nuke. It was always going to be missile deliverable. That, 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 that's not Obama's fault. I mean, when, when this was going on with Bill Clinton, the DPRK was going to build They were working a compact nuke. They weren't, they weren't doing the, the old World War II shit. Um, this is a good question that, that comes up all the time. And 
this is something I think a lot of people need to consider. Can we take the North Korean missiles out? Uh, uh, probably not. Um, we, we, we can to some degree, but here's the thing. Nothing's ever 100% certain. And, you know, DPRK, they know, they know what the plan is. They know that we would be trying to, um, you know, take these missiles out in some kind of preemptive strike, or maybe South Korea would do it in a preemptive strike. So their plan, if I was a North Korean general, I would be building hardened facilities uh, to keep my missiles underground. I would be building trucks, transporter erector launchers to drive missiles all around the country to make them mobile. Um, I would be running a, uh, uh, a nuclear sub, uh, submerged missile program to be able to put uh, a nuclear weapon onto a submarine. Um, and I would also have what I would call battlefield artillery short range nuclear weapons. Um, you know, like Pakistan does this and we did it in the 50s. Um, nuclear weapons that, you know, you launch a nuclear weapon and it goes for say 50, 60 kilometers, a tactical field nuke, battlefield nuke. We don't really subscribe to that too much here in, in the US anymore. We kind of got rid of all that stuff. But, you know, countries like North Korea and Pakistan, they, they build tons of that crap. I mean, Pakistan's building, people would, people would fall out if they knew how many nuclear weapons Pakistan built every year. Builds, builds every year, but I digress. So, okay, get back to taking these things out. Let's look to history as a guide to the future. During the first Gulf War, Iraq was launching Scud missiles at Saudi Arabia and at Israel uh, trying to, in, I guess in the Second Gulf War, trying to, um, trying to hit, you know, U.S. forces uh, in theater and also trying to draw Israel politically into, into the battle, okay? And we had, quote, scud hunters running around. We had satellites, airplanes, you know, ISR, you know, surveillance, reconnaissance, signals intelligence. We had special forces on the ground running all around, you know, was, I guess it was Western Iraq, the desert, the open desert of Western Iraq, trying to find these Scud missiles. Obviously, we weren't 100% successful, and that was a big, wide open desert. I'm not an expert on, on running around and trying to find uh, uh, missiles. Uh, but if many of our, our followers know who Larry Vickers is, email Larry Vickers. Ask him how his scud hunting days went or how Delta Force's scud hunting days went in the Gulf War. You know, they, they, you know it wasn't perfect. It wasn't 100% success rate. And it was a big wide open desert. Now let's talk about North Korea. North Korea, North Korea, um, I would say I think the air I think I think probably the average American doesn't under, unless you were a Korean vet and I apologize for this the average American probably thinks of Korea more like Vietnam and see Vietnam is much farther south I would say, if I was going to describe the having never been to North Korea but looking at it on a map and looking at everything if I was to describe North Korea in terms that that the average American understand as to what the landscape and the atmosphere and the tent and the, uh, or the, uh, the, you know, the, oh, hell, the environment is like, think of it kind of like West Virginia. I think that would be a, uh, there's parts of Korea that are literally, it's like this. I mean, it's just, it's a freaking nightmare. And the, the North Koreans, their transporter erector launchers, their quote, big missile trucks and they're big trucks. They made um, they made their they made their tails I think with tank tracks, uh, so they could drive them. You know they don't they're not stuck on roads. And I wouldn't even be at all surprised if you see the North Koreans put nuclear weapons on to rail cars. And while that seems a little retarded, you know if you if you've got missile sites, you've got missile trucks, you've got missile uh, railroad cars, missile submarines, battlefield. Battlefield nuclear weapons, you're going to get them all? Even if you get all the ones that could hit the U.S., what about the ones that maybe would hit Seoul or hit, hit a port in South Korea? Something to consider. None of, that is, none of that is, you know, a foregone conclusion, and everybody knows this. Okay, next question. Why does Trump keep threatening DPRK? 
I actually, I actually agree with Trump on this a little bit. Um, the media doesn't agree with him, but I look at this in terms of history, and I look at it in terms of geopolitics, and I also look at it in terms of culture, okay? Asian culture... You know what? It's not just Asian culture. I mean, look at some of the places in like the Middle East or, you know, some of these, some of these, I would say, second, third world countries. It's in their culture kind of to run their fucking mouths. I mean, I hate to say it like that, but running your mouth and making these crazy ass threats is kind of how they do business. Like, look at how some of these, you know, look at, look at the you know, the crazy verbiage that North Korea has used against the United States, I mean, for years. I mean, this isn't just recent. I mean, just crazy, crazy shit. And, you know, kind of like how you have to learn as an adult, you need someone with some skill or ability to be able to function and say like the Instagram world. I would say somebody like Donald Trump is very good at functioning in the shit talking world because Here's what's changed. These little po I mean, who who cares what Botswana? I mean, again, I'm not trying to pick on Botswana. I'm just trying to choose some random bullshit country. Who cares if Botswana threatens, you know, Denver? You know, oh, we're going to fire and brimstone, you know, eh, whatever. No one gives a shit. However, if you're going to be in the big leagues, if you're going to be a nuclear power, if you're going to be in that universe of you know, of serious consequences. If you want to be in the big leagues, there's going to be big league rules. As much as the United States and Russia didn't get along and things were really bad during the Cold War, there was always an understanding of, mm, you know, let's not do crazy bullshit. For example, the Russians never did a missile test and intentionally landed uh, ICBMs uh, you know, 14 miles off the coast of San Diego, you know, and we never did missile tests and landed ICBMs off the coast of Murmansk. I mean, you know, we've got the, what the, I can't even say it, the Kowajan Atoll. We have a missile target area. We call everybody. We call these people. We're going to do a missile test. It's going to be this time. Everybody's talking, you know, let everybody know. North Korea, if they want to be in the big leagues, they're going to have to, have to act like goddamn professionals. And Trump, and this is why, um, this is why, um, you know, the Chinese and maybe the media in the U.S., they're a little concerned by Trump. But this is needed right now because Trump is actually going back to a big American tradition that has served the United States very well. A lot of people, they, they glorify past presidents, but they don't really want to study the history. President Eisenhower, after World War II, the truth is, around the world, he kind of had a little bit of a reputation of being a little kind of a dickhead. You know, the world kind of knew, don't fuck with Eisenhower, he'll fuck with you back. Man's got a temper. President General President Eisenhower was not a pushover. Okay, And if you pushed us, we'd push you back. He always operated from an area of strength. Um, I mean, very, you know, I mean, very forward leaning and history is the American history is kind of whitewashed that tradition. And it's interesting if you look at, you know, uh, the succession of safe, the, the administration of Eisenhower to Kennedy and the mistakes Kennedy made in dealing with the Russians that ultimately led to a lot of issues that that never would have, that never were going to happen to Eisenhower. So, you know, I'm not as concerned by Trump uh, running his mouth. I think it actually does some good. And, you know, we have to get North Korea kind of playing ball. You know, if they're going to be a nuclear power, they're going to have to start acting like it. You know, leave people alone. Don't screw with people and we won't screw with you. Okay, so hopefully that. Okay, here's the big one. And this is what a lot of people in the U.S. don't ever want to address. And I think it, I, I, this is my favorite. This is my favorite part of this entire conversation because it's it's very interesting. And this is the meat and potatoes of this video. If you've made it this far, congratulations. Here's my big payoff. What is Kim's military plan? What is North Korea's military plan? Look, 
Everybody wants to infantilize North North Korea. Everybody wants to make it the, all this horseshit drama. But let's, if we look at it from a professional point of view, from a military point of view, from a strategic point of view, what's the plan? They actually have a good plan. It makes, I mean, if I was North Korea, it makes a lot of sense. Okay, let's let's be real. North Korea knows most actually even like. Like, you know, even the Chinese, the China, the two, there's two famous Chinese colonels that wrote a book about, you know, how to deal with the U.S. and, you know, uh, unrestricted warfare or alternative warfare. Because you don't want to fight the U.S., you know, on a, on a, on a one-for-one -one conventional whatever battlefield. Okay, so let's put this in terms of North Korea. And most of, most of our viewers can, can, can understand what I'm about to say. The first Gulf War in 1991 shocked the hell out of everybody. And I can't emphasize that enough. The first Gulf War, look at, look, Saddam Hussein had all of these Russian made weapons, Russian doctrine. Actually, most, most, actually, most of the weapons Iraq had in the first Gulf War were actually Chinese made. He, a lot of Chinese made stuff. But, you know, com block, Chinese, Chinese doctrine, Chinese equipment, Chinese military, a lot of conventional forces, you know, lower quality, more volume, you know, and it's, it's a school of thought that served the com block very well since, you know, since, you know, World War II and, and, and the Nazi invasion and all that. <clears throat> Everybody was shocked by how quickly the 1980s military, well, let's be honest, it's Ronald Reagan's military, conventional military, into the 91 war, how quickly they cut into Saddam Hussein. It really reset, it reset, you know, a lot of, a lot of political and military thinking around the world. It actually was the genesis for why China has decided that they need to really upgrade their military. Their goal has always been, at least in the short term, to try to equal the United States militarily of what we were in the 80s and 91. That's their that was their step one. Obviously they want to get to step two and then parity and then you know maybe even get beyond us. But not just China that looked at that, it was also other countries. Okay. Um, Iran saw what happened to Iraq, obviously. Libya saw what happened to Iraq, okay? North Korea saw what happened to Iraq. Well, you know, Iraq was at the time, what, the, what the fourth, was it the, was it the fourth largest military in the world maybe, or fifth? I mean, it wasn't like some, they weren't, they weren't 57th out of 144 countries. I mean, it, they're, they're big military, and they got, they got hammered. So, if you're North Korea, or you're Iran, or if you're Libya, one of the things that probably at the time you don't want to do is you don't want what happened in the first Gulf War or the second Gulf War to happen to you. And what the U.S. did is the U.S. spent six months moving conventional forces into theater, building up consensus, building up power to array this giant conventional army on their adversary's border and eventually come in and win. So these countries, they've looked at this and they're like, look, if I was North Korea and let's say things really take a shit with Trump and I'm sitting here and Trump decides I'm sending the 101st Airborne in, in the South Korea, and I'm activating the I don't know if it's I mean the you know 18 Airborne you know 18 Airborne Corps. Um, they're all going over, and I've moving this and moving that, and you know Second uh, Marine Division is picking up, and they're going all the way over into Japan, and you know spending six months building up all this stuff. If I'm North Korea, it's like a screw that shit. What I'm going to do is I would take a nuclear weapon and I would pick a port or a major military facility. But I would say like, let's say, I don't know, some port in South Korea and where there's, I don't know, now there's 30,000 U.S. troops have started to, you know, it's a major port to, you know, bring in, you know, all this armor and all these conventional forces for Operation North Korea Freedom. If I'm North Korea, 
I'd take a nuclear weapon and I'd fire right at that port, kill 20,000 Americans, escalate the situation, and then look at the United States and say, so, is Denver worth it? Is New York worth it? Is San Diego worth it? Do you want to keep playing? Do you think you can get all of my missiles? Now, the U.S., a lot of people, they don't understand the idea, of like I call it nuclear nuclear de-escalation or escalation to de-escalate. It's a concept that, this, that the Russians actually subscribe to, but there, there's a form of it that that North the North Koreans would subscribe to. And militarily, it makes complete sense. The idea of causing so much pain to their tier one adversary, which is owned basically us, um, so much pain to their tier one adversary that politically, just like in Vietnam, uh, politically it changes the calculus and maybe it diffuses the situation. Is it worth it, you know, to invade this country, you know? That's the argument for countries like North Korea to have nuclear weapons. Now, think about this one for a minute. Saddam Hussein did not have nuclear weapons in the second Gulf War and wasn't able to keep wasn't able to keep the um, the Americans out. He didn't, you know, he had weapons programs, but didn't have any deployable nuclear weapons. So he wasn't able to you know, he, he, he obviously lost and he ended up getting hung and his neck split and, you know, all that crap. People in North Korea saw that and they didn't forget it. Now let's go back to Libya. After 9-11 and the uh, invasion of Iraq for weapons of mass destruction, a deal was made with the United States and Libya. Because Libya had a nuclear weapons program. Libya had a chemical weapons program. Gaddafi had all this. And he basically was like, you know, there's a new sheriff in town. George Bush ain't playing. And everybody, seriously, Iran kind of backed off for a little bit. Uh, Libya backed off for a little bit. All these people were like, the Americans are going around kicking some ass, and we better get on the right side of this. So Libya signed a deal with the U.S., and gave up their entire weapons of mass destruction program. Their nuclear weapons, chemical, biological weapons. And here's even proof of it. After after Gaddafi fell, you never you didn't really see chemical weapons getting splashed around in Libya. Even now, you don't you don't. There's not like a whole lot of, you know, we're we're, we're all these because we have every reason to believe that Gaddafi gave them up. So fast forward a couple years. So, um, Barack Obama's in power. Hillary Clinton wants to be president. She's Secretary of State, and she's decided that you know there you know the um, the Arab Spring is is going across Libya, and there's what was it like a bunch of um, Libyan troops were heading to was it Misrata? I can't I can't even remember the damn town, but you know. Everybody got on TV and said it's going to be a massacre, and you know, Gaddafi's guys are going to come in and, and kill all these all these rebels, and so we're going to go in, peacekeepers. You know, um, we quote led from the rear. It was it was Hillary's war. Uh, the French went in, and you know, we refueled them and we gave them armaments, and then you know, special forces you guys went in, and look what happened. Look what happened to Saddam Hussein. I mean, to uh, to Muammar Gaddafi, he he. I, I don't want to go into what happened to Muammar Gaddafi, and I don't think most people in the U.S. know what happened to Muammar Gaddafi. But that's some rough. That was some rough treatment. Uh, uh, Saddam got off easy. Muammar 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 gave up his weapons, gave up his ability to cause political, military, and strategic pain to first world powers, then somebody, a new election happens, a new administration happens, and someone like Hillary Clinton comes along and decides she's going to overthrow uh, Muammar uh, for her personal benefit. And countries like North Korea are, are looking at this, and it's like, why would I, why, if I was North Korea, why would I give up my nuclear weapons? Well, I'm not. I'm just, I got. I hate to tell you, there's no way out of this. I would never. If I was North Korea, I would never give them up because the thing is, you know, in four or eight years or twelve years or sixteen years, 
when there's a new president or new administration or new politics, all of a sudden, you know, North Korea becomes, I don't know. I mean, all of a sudden now North Korea is Nazis and it becomes politically expedient to go in there and do something and they don't have nuclear weapons to defend themselves. This is where a lot of the, um, a lot of American foreign policy, especially as it changes from Republican to Democratic administrations, is a little neurotic. So that is there. That's why uh, North Korea will never get nuclear weapons because of uh, because of what happened to Saddam and what happened to Gaddafi. All right. Um, can we take Kim out? That's the next thing. Oh, we'll just we'll just go in there and we'll just kill Kim and. Um, uh, it'll it'll all fall apart. They'll all put their hands up. They'll all they'll all quit. Whatever. That's interesting. That's an interesting concept. We actually tried to do that when we tried to uh, take out Saddam Hussein at Door Farms in the opening, like what was it opening hour or two before the official deadline, as I recall, of the start of the air war in Iraq. Um, here's 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 the here's the problem. Nobody really knows what the command and control is inside of North Korea. I mean, is North Korea, are there, are there, chem, like, North Korea has more than nuclear weapons. North Korea's got, there's, they, there's some pretty good, pretty good indications that North Korea has smallpox. Think about that one for a minute. I mean, they just, they've got more than just VX and, you know, all this other crazy crap. I mean, they've got, it's a, it's a, that's a crazy place, you know. Does Kim have control? Does like does he have like this, like early in U.S. nuclear posture, the civilian government used to keep all the nuclear triggers in one location, and then they would divvy them out to to the military to go ahead and load them in their you know to activate their bombs so they can put them up. And obviously, you know the the idea of of the decapitation strikes or you know things happen so quickly there wasn't enough time to keep to keep strict civilian control over the triggers, over nuclear weapons, so you had to delegate more control to military commanders. They had fully functional nuclear weapons, and you had to trust that they were going to follow orders or not follow orders, or do what you said you told them to do or not do. Nobody's really sure how any of this, I mean, we probably have an idea, the government probably has an idea, but you know, the pundit class, we don't really know how any of this works. Does uh, does North Korea have like I don't know? Do they have like ten regional generals who each have the individual permission to push a button or turn a knob or or do whatever? Or do they have to get do, do they have to get a code from you know from the supreme leader to punch into a computer to launch a missile? I mean I don't know if North Korea's missile program is that is that is that tightly controlled. And then there's the other thing, and I, I, if you're a big movie buff. There's a movie that came out a couple years ago and it has Tom Cruise in it and they talked about they talked about the assassination plan of Hitler in World War II and if you watch that movie and after the after the bomb goes off and you know they're all going around saying Hitler's dead and they're talking to different different officers trying to implement these plans to kind of take over Germany because they've supposedly killed Hitler there's a lot of people in the chain of command that are sitting there going is what you're telling me true is Hitler really dead what if he's not dead what if you're wrong what if this is a test North Korea is such a weird police state the idea that you're going to take out Kim, but the other people who their entire lives is psychologically tied into this deity, God, you know, torture, kill, skin you alive, you know, shoot you with anti-aircraft guns, that they're all of a sudden going to be like, oh yeah, it's all over, we're all free. I don't know. And I think, I think, I think Trump and the Pentagon, they know that as well. There's not really going to be... I don't think the decapitation strike against, you know, against Kim is really going to really play out that well. Um, and then, you know, it's not just, you know, Kim knows that we have plans for decapitation. So, you know, Kim is incentivized to go first because we're incentivized to go first before he goes first. But then he knows, we, he, we know, and so he knows that he's going to have to go first 
before we go first that he goes first and it's just a big giant goddamn mess and it, what it is is everything's going so fast and the decision cycles are happening so quickly the chances it's just it's a nightmare i mean it's it's a terrible situation okay uh let's see here du, du, du. here's the other one can china stop the dprk <clears throat> um in the short term no uh, China, um, China, Ch China has you know competing interests here. China and historically speaking, China and Korea are not really friends. I mean, a lot of again in modern political thought, that doesn't most people don't don't understand that. But you know, historically, you know all these ancient Chinese dynasties and and this Chinese superiority, they think they're the center of the universe, coming down trying to take over Korea and the Koreans fighting them off. That, this, this, psycho, this psychology is, is still there. While they were all butt buddies, you know, being communists, there's still a lot of friction there. So also China is incentivized uh, to tie up U.S. forces uh, on the peninsula and, you know, Korea, North Korea is kind of a big pain in the ass for us. The downside for China is we have it also gives us a forward base. They have a lot of facilities, a lot of firepower. China really doesn't much care for the THAAD or the anti-missile systems, especially the radars. When we're blasting a anti-missile radar into North Korea, it goes straight north into China and it covers a lot of their territory. And we can see stuff on the ground in China based off of radars that are in South Korea. As a matter of fact, we have a, we have a similar situation. We're able to blast radar signatures into China from Bahrain, but that's a whole other conversation. So, you know, China China could China could really hurt Korea as far as um, could really hurt Korea as far as you know economics and, and all that. And China has always had, I would say, back channel back channel um, communications with people. But then every time you hear about uh, uh, every time you hear about uh, North Korea, the leader up there executing people in his country, execute his brother-in-law, execute his uncle, execute his actual brother. Um, this is all in an attempt, mo in most cases, this is to de-incentivize China from having the ability to have like a palace coup. China doesn't want to come in, wipe the slate clean, start the country over, and, you know, and, and start everything from anew. China would rather have a, if they're going to do anything, they would rather have what I would call a palace coup or, a, you know, a colonel's coup where somebody comes in, you know, the old god is dead, I'm the new god, and then the cult just kind of stays stable and the status quo continues. So, you know, also, if a war breaks out in North Korea, nobody really wants a unified Korea. And again, most I don't think most people in the West really understand that. What happened with the Germanys when West Germany ended up merging with East Germany, it basically tanked the West German economy for a decade. I mean, it just, you know, the people in East Germany, were just, they were so they were so broken as a people and so psychologically deficient. They were not able to function in, in a in a in a capitalist society. When there's people in North Korea that defect or sneak over or do whatever in a South Korea, it's very common that these people, they're so mentally backward that they just don't all of a sudden get jobs and function in South Korean society. South Korea has basically decided we don't want any part of unifying with North Korea because we don't want to pay for that shit. I don't. I can't remember what the numbers were, but South Korea has run the numbers of how much money it would cost them to quote unify, and it's 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 it's. I think it's in. I think it's. I think it's in. I think it's in a trillions. I can't even remember, but it's it's a crazy number. And you know, on the inverse, if South Korea is an ally to the U.S. and then Korea is an ally to the U.S. and all of a sudden. Korea is one country, China, you know, China has a historically bad relationship with Korea in general, historically, not now. China tries to actually not really piss off the Koreans, South, South Korea or North Korea. 
you know, does the do, does China want a U.S. naval base in what's the what's the what's the what's the harbor in North Korea? Uh, you know, only a few miles from the Chinese border. Can you imagine U.S. you know Marines and and Navy ships stationed there? I mean, China doesn't want that at all. So, China's trying to manage the crash. They don't want all these refugees coming across. They don't want a nuclear exchange, but they also don't want the U.S. to take over North Korea either, or South Korea to take over North Korea. So there's even there's even an argument. If I was China and a big battle breaks out in North Korea. Would it incentivize me as China to say, screw it, shoot across the border just to grab a bunch of land? And then what happens when uh, Chinese forces are now interfacing with allied South Korean U.S. forces? It, that is uh, un unintended consequences. Okay, next question. Will Donald Trump go first after North Korea? Nope, 100% no won't happen um, because what it, it guaranteed with the artillery and counter battery strikes uh, in Seoul, I mean, you're going to lose thousands and thousands of th thousands of civilians, and nobody wants to be blamed. Trump is not going to go first. Trump is not going to launch a preemptive strike against North Korea. He's not going to do it. Now, if he sees something like they're fueling missiles, and we have a good reason to believe that they're going to do X, Y, or Z, or one, two, and three, the calculation may change, and you know we'll see what we go, but it'd have to be something that they can prove, because um, nobody wants to get blamed for the deaths that are inevitably gonna happen in Seoul. Um, what if DPRK shoots missiles near Guam? Um, that could very likely uh, get a response from the US. We may actually try to shoot those missiles down, um, it, it, again, it would be, it be, would it be legal for DPRK to fire a test missile? I don't know, 30 kilometers, or I don't know, let's see, more than 12 miles off the, off the coast of Guam, 12 miles would be the international, you know, boundary. Uh, yeah, technically it would be legal, but would it be smart? And then at some point, you know, it's like what I talked about, you know, we didn't fire a test missile outside of Murmansk and the Russian didn't fire a test missile outside of San Diego. So that could potentially get a response out of Trump. What that response would be, nobody's really sure. Maybe shoot the missiles down, but here's the thing. If you try to do something in North Korea, let's say, well, we fire some missiles in North Korea like we did in Assyria. No one really knows what the North Korean command and control is or how the information flows in that country. How do you, if, 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 if the North Koreans see you know, Tomahawk missiles hit one of their airfields, how do they know that it's a conventional strike to say fuck you and not the opening move on a decapitation strike and they launch missiles? You gotta realize not everybody, the flow of information, how everybody, everybody makes decisions, you know, it's not a foregone conclusion. I mean, mistakes are made and that's the biggest fear with North Korea is a mistake um, because they're kind of a retarded you know, politically country. So, all right. Um, discussed uh, chemical, biological, nuclear weapons. What can go? Um, what can go wrong? Uh, I would say the the biggest things that can go wrong. I've already addressed one. We do a. Um, we do a. Uh, I don't know. We shoot down. They shoot, they fire missiles at, at around Guam, and um, we do. Um, you know, we, we hit the missiles or maybe we try to do something back to them and they take it the wrong way. Now, also, you got to realize North Korea is not this very stable country where that they don't fuck with people. They are constantly doing stuff, you know, fence line shootings, kidnapping people. They blew up the South Korean frigate, you know, what, 10 years ago or whatever it was. Um, they, I mean, they're, they, they're flying drones into South Korea. They, what was it? I remember they were, they had a bunch of like at one point, was it in the 80s, a bunch of special forces, North Korean special forces on hang gliders, all of a sudden start coming across a DMZ, <coughs> excuse me. And I think South Korea spent weeks hunting these fuckers down. I mean, yeah, they captured some of them, killed a bunch of them. I mean, just crazy like James Bond, you know, movie crazy stuff, like Mission Impossible stuff. And so the biggest fear is, Let's say there's some rogue artillery officer. He decides to crank off a round across the DMZ. You know, are we going to let that fly? 
the way, you know, things were in the past. If we're going to treat North Korea like they're a major power, if you're going to be a nuclear power, you can't be shelling villages in South Korea. Okay, or let's say somebody in the Panmunjom village takes a rifle and shoots a South Korean or American soldier. You know, things are so tense right now that these things could be misinterpreted on both sides. North Korea can misinterpret a response as the beginning of an attack, and we could we could overplay or underplay a hand because we're trying to teach North Korea that they need to get you know get with the game and stop being stop being you know a third world jackass to start acting acting like a nuclear power. So, all right, we literally just hit an hour, and that's pretty much everything I got. So that ends the the um, the uh, uh, armory chat, I guess, episode 31 of the DPRK missile program and what's really going on and what's at stake. Uh, we'll probably do a follow-up on this on our blog page at john1911.com. That's j-o-h-n-1911.com. Just remember, it's all about shooting guns and having fun. Everybody, have a good day.